Hi, I'm Fiona Patton and um, I'm the leader of the Reason Party and I'm also the member for Northern Metropolitan, or I have been for the last four years. It's like there's too many to mention. Like I've, you know, I've been the deciding vote on so many pieces of legislation, but I think probably the things I'm, I'm proudest of was um, the initiating the voluntary assisted dying laws. Uh, initiating the medically supervised injecting centre, initiating the safe access zones around abortion clinics. So on all of those, I was the catalyst for reform. I either wrote the legislation or I got the inquiries going. Um, but on top of that, I also wrote the first bill to legalise Uber. And just did probably the last thing that I did in, in Parliament was in 2022 there will be a cap on the spending on elections, which means we're not going to see that sort of trees and trees of paper in your mailboxes and we'll start seeing less and less annoying ads. We started uh, as the sex party. And that, and that party was founded largely on frustration that we could see the community going in one direction, but politicians and parliaments going in the other. And you saw that on assisted dying, you saw that on marriage equality, on censorship, and particularly internet censorship. So that's where we started. So we come from that civil libertarian background. We come from that background that adults should be treated as adults, uh, whether that's for drug law reform, or as I say, for assisted dying. But as we've grown and I suppose matured and we've taken on the mantle of reason, that, that, that policy base hasn't changed but it's expanded. And my time in Parliament has enabled us to develop, uh, develop policies around public transport, around housing, around health, um, around the ec economy of the, of, the, of the state. So we've expanded out but our base is a civil libertarian base. I like to say, well, we're the leaders, and those other parties follow us, and, and, it, and it is quite true. Like we, you know, but I'm, 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 I'm not going to dissuade them from doing that because we do need pill testing and we do need drug law reform, and the more parties that jump on board, the better. Uh, I, I think what sets us apart is also that we play better with others. We're a very pragmatic party. I don't try and I don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. And I think other parties, it's either their way or the highway, or whether that's the Liberal Party or the Greens or, or other parties. Uh, we take a, a, a stance that we're not there to disrupt the government, we're there to work with the government. And I think our track record has proven that we've been effective in, in working with governments um, rather than butting heads against them. And that's meant that we've been able to nudge them and achieve a lot of our goals. I don't think so. I, I think, you know, we call them progressive issues, but actually they're sensible. They're common sense issues. You know, for example, if you look at drug law reform, so if we didn't, if we treated drug use, adult drug use, as a health issue, not a criminal one, we would save the state $168 million in three years. Now, if I was a Liberal Party member looking for small government, looking for less tax, I would be looking for those types of savings. I'd also be looking at the added benefit of that, that it reduces our costs in the jail system and it also sets people on for an early intervention or early treatment. So again, saving money. So I, I've been a lobbyist for 20 years. I have worked on, with both sides of government um, from the outside and I think if I'm fortunate enough to be re-elected and, you know, and there is a change of government, I see myself being able to work effectively with the Liberal Party um, in a still affecting change uh, for, for, for all the right reasons. A, that it's good for society, but you know, B, it's actually good for our economy. I, I think there's a number of areas. I, I certainly think drug law reform uh, is, is really important. We do not want to see our friends having terrible experiences at festivals and at parties. We, we want to see everyone safe. 
We want to see everyone properly informed around drug use. Public transport. You know, less and less and less young people are actually driving cars or getting like driver's licenses. So I think we would want to see better public transport. I was really happy. We campaigned for 24 hour public transport on weekends in the lead up to the 2014 election. And the government picked that up. So we'll continue to urge the government to, to be practical about, about better public transport. But, I, you know, I think like everyone, we're worried about housing affordability. We're worried about the fact that we can still get evicted for, for no reasons from our rental properties. We're also worried about the lack of transparency. You know, I don't think it's a student-specific thing that we don't trust governments anymore. So we would argue that greater transparency is another thing that not only students want, but the whole of the whole of Victoria would like to see. We're sick of hearing about water. We're sick of hearing politicians talk about politicians, frankly. I think there's a number of ways we can do this, but we need to be creative. And it doesn't mean that governments need to be selling off land. There's things like build to rent, where the, the developer or the company is given a peppercorn rent, they build, they develop, and they manage that property. There's ways to, to reinvent some of the spaces that we already have. You know, I query all of those tax-free religious organisations that are sitting on billions of dollars of assets of property, and many of them are empty. Let's, let's start addressing that. If, if we start freezing rents and if we start doing these sorts of things, if the government over-regulates the rental market, then that, that ends in disaster, you know, because you can't control the whole rental market. You'll be able to control pockets of it, which will affect the areas that are not controlled. We have put through fair rental laws, and, and I was part of the process of putting those laws through. Um, I don't have a checkbook, so I'm not going to like promise that I'm going to build 50,000 houses like some political parties are doing. Like, that it's, it's just, it's silly. What I can do is say that we need to provide better tax structures so that whether that's not-for-profit organisations or for-profit organisations have got an incentive to build affordable housing. And I suspect that that is our solution. And certainly that has proven to be the solution in countries like Canada, the Netherlands, Germany and parts of the US. What I have heard of the law and order debate from both sides is not being smart on crime, it's being completely stupid. You know, we know that someone who is incarcerated, we increase their chances by 60% of committing another crime and being re-incarcerated. So we establish a revolving door. Mandatory sentencing doesn't work, never has worked, and I think is a clear blurring of the lines between the judiciary and the executive. You know, this is not how our country and our state is supposed to operate. What we need to do is we need to be looking at the causes of crime and preventing it. It's much cheaper. Uh, $1,300 a day nearly to lock up a 17 year old who's probably had a life of trauma, has been neglected by family. Now, frankly, if I had $1,700 a day to look after a troubled kid, I wouldn't be putting them in Parkville. There would be lots of other options. So treating drug use as a health issue because we know the vast majority of people who are committing those burglaries are doing it because they've got a drug habit. So let's try and be smart on crime. There's lots of other options, lots of other options that not only are more effective but are cheaper. I think it's actually a very interesting proposition around wage theft because frankly it is theft. When people aren't being paid properly, when people are being paid illegally effectively by not being paid the proper rates, and that does affect students because they work in casual employment more than anyone. It, this is not about being protecting workers, this is just about ensuring that employers do the right thing. I don't want to ban greyhound racing. I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of greyhound racing, but I don't want to see it banned. I want to see it operating ethically, fairly, and transparently. 
And, and as we know, prohibition doesn't work in any area. So you start pushing things underground, you start banning, prohibiting things, um, you end up in more trouble. So let's look at regulation and transparency. And I think that the industry is working very hard to achieve that. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think prohibition is or banning is ever the answer for anything really. Again, this is about regulation, this is about finding that middle ground and that sweet spot. So it's about protecting the vulnerable, but treating adults as adults. I put up amendments just last year to uh, maybe put a maximum spin. So just a maximum amount that people can spend every minute um, in, a poker in a poker machine venue. To restrict the hours so that problematic gamblers actually you know, can go home or have a reason to go home. When it, those venues are open 24 hours a day, there's no reason to go home. Uh, look at the causes of problematic gambling. And I know from the people I've spoke to, a lot of it's around loneliness and social isolation, for women in particular, that they don't find another place to go where they feel safe. They end up in a post machine venue. So I think looking at some of those issues, but. Yeah, I think the poker machine industry has had a free ride for too long and we do need to bring back some regulation. As I say, I don't want to ban it, I just want to see some sensible regulation. In fact, the sensible regulation and recommendations that the, that the Competition and Consumer Commission recommended.